Now Richard Voucher, Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asian Affairs, testifies on the upcoming Pakistani elections. The Pakistani elections are scheduled for February 18th after being delayed over a month due to the assassination of Benazir Bhutto. He testified before House Oversight and Government Reform Committee yesterday for about an hour and 20 minutes. Chance to settle in. Is water going to be enough? Good morning and thank you all for coming. I want to particularly thank uh, our witness for being here this morning. He's on quite a busy schedule and came in on short notice because we've been trying to have this hearing for a couple of weeks. The uh, ambassador has been traveling uh, and uh, doing a lot of work on that. He's also scheduled to testify at 1 o'clock in front of the Intelligence Committee. That will be a closed hearing from uh, my experience with that group. I think it's important that we have an open hearing so that the ambassador gets to share with us what's going on from his perspective and the administration's perspective. And so we're continuing our oversight on the national security interests at stake in Pakistan, and particularly with respect to the elections for February 18th. Um, the 9-11 Commission and our own intelligence agencies repeatedly stressed the central importance of Pakistan and efforts to rout out uh, terrorism. Uh, a growing chorus of others have joined them, also raising serious concerns about how we're doing in that struggle. Uh, most striking, I think, was the last summer's uh, national intelligence estimate uh, of the resurgent al-Qaeda in Pakistan safe havens. Over the past year, our subcommittee has had vigorous oversight. Two congressional delegations have gone to Pakistan. We've had at least three uh, previous hearings on the issue, one of which uh, the ambassador was, was present at. And the central lesson, at least that I've taken from that, is that if we really care about preventing another situation like 9-11, if we care about bringing Osama bin Laden to justice, if we care about protecting our soldiers in Afghanistan from the escalating cross-border attacks, then we absolutely have a crucial interest in ensuring that the government in Pakistan has the popular mandate to confront extremism and terrorism within its borders. We've heard over and over again about the importance of the United States speaking with a clear and unamb unambiguous voice about the need for the upcoming elections to establish the legitimacy of a Pakistani government in order to instill confidence in the Pakistani people that they will, uh, that their will is reflected in the election results. At times, Ambassador, you and others in the administration have uh, voiced the same sentiments. For example, on early July 12th of 2007 at a hearing you testified we believe that Pakistan must make a full transition to democracy and civilian rule. Uh, but at other times, our country's message seems to have been mixed and uh, muddled. Uh, Deputy Secretary Negroponte and other officials have called President Musharraf indispensable. Uh, and you referred to the suspension of the Pakistani Constitution as a bump in the road. Uh, many more times, uh, our lack of words, our lack of actions, for example, with respect to uh, the relation we have with President Musharraf's purging of judges from the Pakistani courts, speak volumes, especially to the Pakistani people. And while the essential goal of free and fair elections in Pakistan seems to be slipping from our grasp, just last month on December 20th, we heard from a distinguished panel of election observers from across the political spectrum who, included, uh, who concluded unambiguously that pre-election preparations offered little hope to the Pakistani people that their voices will be heard in a free, fair, and transparent election. The former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle who had recently returned from an election assessment trip to Pakistan, concluded that free, fair, and transparent elections would be impossible without significant, sincere, and immediate corrective action on the part of the government of Pakistan. He noted, without the restoration of Chief Justice Iftika Chowdhury and the other deposed justices, public confidence in the ability of the judicial system to act independently and ensure the transparency of electoral process will be significantly curtailed. Tom Garrett, from the International Republican, Republican Institute testified that the government of Pakistan, invoking security concerns, had limited polling place access for international election monitors. Mr. Garrett also spoke about IRI's recent poll showing a plummeting of support for President Musharraf. And former Priest Corps Director Mark Schneider expressed the view of the International Crisis Group by emphasizing the central role the judiciary plays in the integrity of the Pakistan electoral process. He noted, the United States and its Western allies must recognize that free and fair elections are the best option for a secular and moderate parliamentary majority, a unified country against extremist jihadi organizations, the Taliban, and al-Qaeda. The testimony of those three individuals emphasized the widespread atmosphere of insecurity and intimidation that strike at the heart of any credible uh, democratic process. The voters' polls failed to inspire confidence and raise the specter of massive disenfranchisement. The media continues to operate under a code of conduct that criminalizes criticism of President Musharraf's government. Many of Pakistan's leading judges and lawyers remain silenced, if not imprisoned. Opposition parties struggle to make their case under restrictions on political expression and campaigning. 
leading opposition figures remain disqualified. There is a fear that Pakistan's fearsome intelligence and security services may again play an inspired and insipid role in rigging and intimidation. And international election observers face disabling barriers to polling place access. As bleak as these assessments were, the electoral environment in Pakistan has unfortunately deteriorated since our December 20th hearing. On December 27th, former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto was assassinated in Rawalpindi. Her assassination was a blow to supporters of democracy and opponents of violent extremism everywhere. Former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, in the light of the widespread Pakistani view of United States complicity with what they believe is a dictatorial government, sees electoral strength in bashing the United States. The military and terrorism, once largely confined to the federally administered tribal areas, has spilled into the streets of the provincial capital of Peshawar and elsewhere. The elections were delayed until February 18th, and rumors abound among some that President Musharraf is looking for a way to postpone those elections, perhaps indefinitely. Yet despite the essential need of a legitimate and impartial judiciary in the electoral process, this administration, the Bush administration, appears willing to concede a dismantled judiciary to President Musharraf. Despite signs that the vaunted Pakistani military establishment is distancing itself from President Musharraf, this administration at home appears willing to continue and expressing steadfast support for President Musharraf. Despite evidence that President Musharraf's cling to power represents a distraction to our counterterrorism efforts, we continue to pursue policies described by Pakistanis as Musharraf. Over the past summer, when you testified early before us, Ambassador, I noted it is often said that Pakistan is a place of breathtaking complexity. It is in part because of this that our long-term national security interests are best served by forging bonds with the Pakistani people and not with any one particular leader. That's what our hearing about is about today. Uh, I look forward to hearing your comments. I note that uh, we've waived any uh, introductory statement in writing or otherwise by you, Ambassador, so we can get the questions and answers because of your pressing schedule and other obligations today. Uh, Mr. Shays, do you want to make any opening statement? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first let me say uh, I appreciate the ambassador being here in deference to your time schedule. I'm going to waive my written statement and just say that your statement captures much of what I feel. I am particularly concerned about judicial interference and the dismantling of the judiciary. I'm concerned about Election Day uh, monitoring uh, and the position that the uh, government may take against the International Republican Institute and its efforts to monitor. And, um, I'm uh, concerned uh, that uh, we not make the error that we made in Iran with deciding that while we didn't like the Shah, because we didn't like the Shah, we would just throw our support to Khomeini, uh, and we ended up with that. So uh, we're treading on thin ice, and uh, we need to act intelligently, and frankly, I don't know what action is required. That's why I appreciate this hearing. Thank you, Mr. Shays. We're going to move to uh, testimony and, and, and questions. As uh, my uh, introduction is of Ambassador Richard A. Bauscher, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs of the United States Department of State. Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, we swear in our witnesses, as you know, as the subcommittee, could I ask you to please rise and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. The record will reflect that the answer was in the affirmative. Uh, we've waived your written testimony. You may want to make a few opening comments. If you do, Ambassador, we'd certainly like to hear them. If I could, sir, I'd like certainly. to thank Certainly. Important, um, and uh, the uh, success of Pakistan as a nation, as a moderate, modern, prosperous nation, able to fight extremism, is one of our vital national interests. And I appreciate. Uh, let me say right off the top, I appreciate the fact that you've traveled there, Mr. Lynch, and others, members of the committee, have traveled out there to look at our operations and look at uh, the situation firsthand, but also to pursue many of these issues. Uh, and the emphasis that we, as Americans, that all of us place on a democratic transition in Pakistan. Um, we've certainly seen a lot of turmoil in Pakistan in the last, uh, well, last year, last nine months especially. Um, emergency rule in November, December, uh, suspension of the Constitution, restrictions on freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, uh, and then the very tragic and sad uh, assassination of Benazir Bhutto, which took one of the major leaders of Pakistan from uh, from the nation. Um, we've seen uh, increased militancy in the northwest frontier and uh, more and more clashes between the army and the militants uh, up in the tribal areas. Uh, violent extremists have declared war on Pakistan's democratic process. And I think the assassination of Ms. Bhutto is a sign of that. 
um, they continue to target politicians and the political process as we move forward into the elections and probably afterwards. Um, despite the unrest, I think our fundamental goals in terms of uh, what we're trying to achieve with Pakistan remain unchanged. Uh, we want to see a successful transition to democracy and civilian rule. Uh, we want to see uh, the uh, emergence of leaders through a, a credible election. Uh, we want to see a strong moderate center uh, that can complete this transition and help uh, form a solid basis for pursuing the fight against extremism and uh, the building of strong democratic institutions, including an independent judiciary in Pakistan. Our assistance programs focus on these areas in a fundamental and long-term way. Uh, we're spending over $125 million this year on education. Uh, we promote health programs that serve the people of Pakistan. We've had a lot of programs that promote economic growth, uh, as well as security and counter-narcotics. Uh, we've had about $100 million over the last few years that's been spent on democracy programs, including $25 million or so that was spent directly on elections. Um, so it's a very important uh, balance in our efforts. It's an important balance that maintains a whole breadth of interest in the Pakistani people and in trying to help them achieve the kind of nation and society that they aspire to. Uh, we have seen some positive trends in Pakistan uh, over the years and even in recent times. Um, the civil society and the media are strong, although they've taken some hits. Uh, the Army is taking on the militant extremists, and they've conducted operations uh, in the Swat Valley and are now conducting operations in Waziristan against extremist elements. Um, all the major political parties, um, uh, while they are criticizing the election process, uh, have made the judgment that it's better be in than out, and they're going to participate in the elections. And obviously, their view of how the elections turn out will be one of the very important factors that we use uh, as we see after the election uh, from the parties, from the observers, from the media, uh, how it was conducted and whether we think it meets the, the standards um, that we're all looking for, and that is an election that can uh, reflect the true wishes of the Pakistani people and the Pakistani voters. Um, we uh, are doing everything we can to try to ensure as fair an election as possible. We have um, supported efforts for a long time now, as I said, with the money we've spent over the last two or three years. Um, but we're also um, supporting things on election day, like uh, fielding observers, strong election observer missions. Uh, we're supporting the Asia Foundation's work in fielding something like 20,000 domestic observers in Pakistan. Um, we have uh, organized embassy uh, teams from the embassy and the, and the consulates in Islamabad and in uh, the other cities of Pakistan. About 30 teams will be sent out by the U.S. mission in Pakistan to go look at key races around the country. And we're working very closely with the International Republican Institute uh, to try to see if they can't uh, send their people back and conduct the observation that they had planned. Um, I think its leadership uh, has yet to make the final decision on whether they're going to re-engage. Um, we've worked with the European Union on their observers who are out there now and more to come. So we think that's an important element in trying to ensure that the elections as fair and free as possible because just the scrutiny encourages people to better behavior. We also have had a very active and ongoing dialogue with the Pakistani government and the Pakistani Election Commission about improving the election environment. Uh, with some of the steps that we've been looking for have been taken. Uh, whether you go back to the, uh, the need for transparent ballot boxes and, and uh, 300,000 transparent ballot boxes that were purchased, uh, other aspects of, uh, of counting and, and uh, tabulating the results that we've pressed very hard on, some of which have been done, many of which remain to be done. Uh, but they've recently taken some steps that we encouraged. Uh, they've clarified guidelines for international observers, promising full access to all the polling stations and all the activities at the polling stations. Uh, they've printed the uh, and distributed electronic copies of the voter rolls. This was an issue that was very, very important uh, to people. They've now published a list of polling stations in the official government newspaper, so everybody knows in advance where the polls are going to be. 
that unfortunately has been a problem in previous elections in Pakistan was one of the things that early on the experts pointed out to us as being a, an issue and that's been done. Um, and we're uh, pushing very hard for transparency and counting so that they publish results at the, at the lowest uh, polling station level, put it on public display so that people like the Asia Foundation with their observers and the media can do independent tallies to make sure numbers don't get added along the way as the, as the totals get made. So we, uh, we continue to work very hard uh, to try to ensure an election that's as free and fair as possible. And we have been, I think, really working with a lot of people, uh, whether domestic and foreign, um, think it's time for everybody to work as hard as they can to try to make this a good election. And that's where we're putting most of our energy right now. Uh, President Musharraf has made uh, repeated and public promises uh, that there will be a fair and transparent election. Uh, and we expect uh, him to try to work to uh, make sure that happens. Uh, Secretary Rice uh, put it fairly succinctly uh, the, the other day after she saw President Musharraf. She said, these elections need to be elections that will have the confidence of Pakistanis. That's the important point. Uh, and so we will look to Pakistanis uh, on this issue. Uh, you raise the question of the judiciary. Uh, it is a difficult question in Pakistan. If you look back at the history of Pakistan almost from the start, uh, there have been direct and serious clashes between the executive and the judicial branches. Uh, they've never, uh, I guess to say that they, they need and haven't had uh, an independent, responsible judiciary that everybody accepts. Um, we have made this point over and over. Uh, we have urged the government of Pakistan to release the uh, people who remain in detention, three attorneys, eight Supreme Court, and three high court justices um, under house arrest. And we've urged that those uh, people be released from detention. Uh, we have urged the political leaders and the other leaders in Pakistan to focus on the need for an independent judiciary uh, but frankly, it had become a very political issue in Pakistan, and um, I think it's fair to assume that they won't really address it seriously until after the election, and that the new leaders, the political party leaders um, that emerge from the election, as well as the other people in the government, are going to have to address this. And we're obviously very prepared to bring whatever expertise, resources, uh, and support we can to that process. But. Uh, I think we all understand how important it is for Pakistan to have an independent judiciary that people can count on. We've also continued to encourage uh, the government to release the remaining restrictions on the media. Uh, GOTV is now back on the air, uh, including their news channel. It's one of the most popular in the country. Uh, but there are still restrictions and codes of conduct that apply to the media that we think should be lifted in order to help ensure a more free election. Um, after the election, there'll be a lot to do. Um, the new players in Pakistan, the new uh, people elected in the, in the political parties will have to decide on prime minister. The new prime minister will have to work with President Musharraf as president in a new role. Um, the institutions of society need to be looked at, and, and some of them, like the judiciary, rebuilt. Uh, so it will be a very complicated process, but we look forward to supporting that process. We look forward to working with whoever emerges from a good election as prime minister. Uh, and we will look forward to maintaining our very strong relationship with the Pakistani people. So why don't I stop at that for the moment, and I would be glad to take your questions. Thank you very much. You, you covered a lot of ground on that, and we appreciate it. Uh, let me ask uh, the first question, Ambassador. Is the United States going to be aggressive in its support for an independent United States investigation into the slaying of Benazir Bhutto? We have been um, very aggressive in supporting the idea that there needs to be a, a, a thorough investigation and, and a good investigation of the slaying of the uh, killing of Benazir Bhutto. Um, the uh, Pakistanis have pledged to do that. They have brought in expertise from Scotland Yard. And our understanding is there's good cooperation there between Scotland Yard and the Pakistani investigators. Allow me, if you will, to um, press that a little bit only because... We have not gone farther than that. Okay. Will you go further than that? Because I know there's great concern that the uh, directive to Scotland Yard is, is not uh, as broad as some would, might like it in terms of finding out uh, who's responsible uh, other than to find out how it might have happened. Uh, and in order to put some confidence in this in the international community, isn't our administration taking the position that we should ask for a United Nations 
uh, internationally uh, run investigation so that we can all have confidence in that going forward? We, we have not taken that position, sir. Um, there is a lot of, uh, I think, differences and, and uh, uh, differences between the other cases where UN investigations have been done. It's not a cure-all uh, for any situation. I think we look to, first and foremost, to the local authorities to conduct any investigation. The addition of Scotland Yard, we think, provides an added measure of confidence, um, and we'll all be watching that very, very closely and see how it turns out. Um, if there are problems, I suppose we'll deal with them at that point. Well, uh, let me, for one at least, uh, weigh in, Mr. Ambassador, that uh, my position, I think, and joined by others, is this, this administration ought to take a forceful stand on that. It's, it's not going to be in anybody's interest to have an investigation that is clouded well, that doesn't have the confidence of not just the Pakistani people, but people internationally. And I think right now, uh, there's enough of a question about uh, Mr. Musharraf's, uh, you know, his conviction to this. Uh, never mind uh, the fact that you know there's some question about that. As I said, the directions that have been given to the Scotland Yard. I don't think it serves our purposes uh, for our security or anybody else's to have this thing not have the confidence of the Pakistani people and others. And I, I believe the way it's going forward now, not being an, an independent UN investigation. Uh, really puts us in jeopardy of having it uh, not be accepted the way it should be on any results. So I, I just hope that you'll consider that and maybe rethink the position on this or bring it back to the administration and, uh, and say that there are plenty of people who think that it ought to be ratcheted up a level here and, uh, and moved on. Let me just address some comments that you made on the judiciary. Uh, given the fact that already the President's, President Musharraf's election is, is questioned by many as to its legitimacy, uh, and having had the testimony of all of the individuals that have been before us about the election observations they've made, uh, that the judiciary is a critical component of the election process in Pakistan, and who appoints the judges to the various levels that make decisions with respect to challenges to any aspect of the election, about the determination of the counts and other aspects. Unless, you know, the Musharraf presidency and, and the administration over there is willing to allow the release of people that are in prison right now are constrained in the judiciary and appoint people that are not perceived to be his puppets in there. How are we ever going to get people to accept uh, any elections as being legitimate? Well, I think first and foremost, it's the conduct of the elections that people will judge. Um, they will know how things went. Um, there are plenty of observers. There will be a lot of media. Um, will be international and domestic observers. Uh, as, as we've noted, the political parties at the moment are participating. They've also raised a lot of red flags and said, there's problems here, problems there, things that ought to be fixed. And we're pushing very hard to get many of those things fixed before the election. Um, the judiciary comes into play afterwards. Uh, if, the, uh, uh, if there are serious charges of fraud and, and uh, abuse, if those aren't settled appropriately by the election commission, then the judiciary would get involved. Um, but I think uh, first and foremost, it's try, uh, our effort is to try to get a good election up front uh, so you don't have to ultimately fall back on, on uh, judicial mechanisms that are in, the, in themselves are quite controversial. But challenges to the voter polls uh, and other aspects prior to election and during election are going to be brought to those judges, and it's, it's going to be in, important on that. And, and I think uh, that we have to not just be worried to look at the fallout afterwards. I think we ought to be a little more proactive. You say that we're doing things to try to correct them on the front end. Uh, but one of the things we ought to do to correct is make sure people that are going to make decisions about the number of challenges that have been made uh, to the polls, to the, uh, to the polling places, to the fact that uh, the code of conduct still exists in the media, so I don't know how we can trust the reports uh, that are going to be made about the election. They're certainly not going to be critical if a reporter stands the prospect of not only being fined but going to jail. Uh, what are the prospects of getting these things addressed prior to the election, or are we just in a mode of we're going to ask the President Bashar to do it, and when he doesn't do it, we're going to deal with the fallout afterwards? I think there have been a lot of things addressed prior to the election. Uh, if you read, you, you referred in your opening statement to the reports that the uh, National Democratic Institute had done. And if you go back and you read the one they did in May and the one they did in October and the testimony in December, some of the things that they were focused on were, were consistent throughout, but some of the things that they were focused on changed from time to time because there was, in fact, changes, there were in fact uh, progress. Um, I think we've, we've come out of the state of emergency uh, with some uh, serious distortions left on the process of the elections, uh, with some things that still need to be corrected. Uh, we have uh, things in Pakistan that we've, if you look at previous elections, that were real serious problems. I, I cited transparent ballot boxes just as one that's easy to point to. 
but a lot of other things, uh, interference by local officials and other such things. So I think we're both looking at the uh, problems that have existed from way back in the past as well as the more recent ones and just trying to get as many fixed as we can. The more they get fixed, the better the election. My time is up. I, I want to stop. I just You mentioned the uh, National Democratic Institute. Uh, their own comment from Senator Dasher, who was there on behalf of that committee, was in fact, and I quote him now, virtually nothing has been done since our first report of May 2000, uh, from May 2007 to strengthen the prospects for free and fair elections. So there has not been that continuum of improvement, as, as you recommend, at least not in the National Democratic Institute's problem, and that's what we're dealing with here. There hasn't been that kind of reform or changes in the situation that they pointed out the trouble back in May still existed in December. So that's, I think, why we're trying to urge some more concerted effort on behalf of the administration here. Mr. Shays. But Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, defer to my colleague who has been in Pakistan. I haven't been, so I'm going to just pay attention for a little bit. Uh, with unanimous consent, uh, we'd be more than happy to invite him to participate and, and go out of turn, as a, unless people want to take their prerogative. We'll go out of turn and allow you to do a question now. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, there's some, nothing more bipartisan on this committee than elections. And uh, the IRI, obviously, you're familiar with their attempts to do work in, uh, in Pakistan. Let me just bring to your attention, again, a couple of things. You're familiar with the exchange of letters between the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Statistics back in October. Okay. I'm not sure I am. Let me put it in perspective. Are you aware the IRI has been told to cease and desist and leave the country? Have you been told that there's been a cat and mouse game played with their uh, visas uh, repeatedly, uh, that both their head and their interim heads have been denied timely visas every time the extension of an election occurs, what a surprise. They have to play for another month or two just to try to get that. But in particular, I'm going to call your attention and ask unanimous consent these two documents be placed in the record from the Pakistani government. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, not only has the government of Pakistan Ministry of Economic Affairs and Statistics basically said we need a, uh, an MOE, more than an MOU, we need to register the GOP and the IRI because uh, we need, the IRI needs to be registered in order to do business on elections. Uh, what's the point of having international observers if, if they have to somehow come up with a bunch of credentials beyond those which the United States government and your kind office uh, bring to bear? Uh, secondly, and most importantly, the denying uh, on December 24th, just three days before the assassination of the lead prime minister candidate, uh, uh, Mrs. Budo, they answered a uh, clearly stating that exit polls would not be allowed. They were not, they were not approved and not be allowed. Clearly, if we expect, and we do expect, there to be gaming of the system, including the now translucent, not transparent, ballot boxes, wouldn't you say that exit polls are about the only way to get some relative le uh, feel for the level of uh, gaming of the system post-election? Um, sir, I'm, I've worked very closely with IRI, and I've talked to them a number of times, and our people in Pakistan, our embassy in Pakistan has worked very closely with them as well. Um, so let me, let me make a couple comments. Uh, I'm not familiar with a letter from October about registering, and I'll have, to, I'll have to look into that and see what the basis of that was and what happened to it. Um, we have worked very closely with them and the Pakistani government on the visa question. Um, they have gotten their visas renewed. Um, not as long as we would like, but for the moment everybody is satisfied that that question is taken care of at least through the elections. Um, they were very concerned about remarks that the uh, Secretary of the Election Commission made, I think it was December 26th, uh, about polling places and access to polling places and how they would be allowed to go to places. Uh, we worked with them and with the Election Commission and uh, about uh, two weeks ago, the Election Commission put out a statement that clarified that to the satisfaction of all of us, that in fact observers, domestic and foreign, uh, would be allowed to go to all polling places and see all aspects of the process. Uh, uh, but uh, not do exit polling. But not, let me get to exit polling. Um, Exit polling, as far as I understand it, has not been widely done in Pakistan before. We think it would be a very useful adjunct to the process, and we have made that point. 
Um, you ask, is that the only way to, to find out if people are gaming the system and where the distortions are? And the answer is I don't think so. I think there are other ways, and we've been pushing very hard on those. Um, Asia Foundation is going to try to run a parallel vote count with their domestic observers to collect the numbers uh, at, the, at the polling station level and, and add them up themselves. Uh, that's a very useful check on the system. Uh, the media will be out far and wide. Um, checking on such things. We have encouraged uh, very strongly with the Election Commission and the leadership in Pakistan that there be full transparency, that the count be done uh, you know, on chalkboards and rooms where everybody could watch the numbers being added up. Um, and there's a variety of things like that that we have continued to press, uh, one of which I mentioned in my opening remarks, which was uh, posting of, of uh, results at the polling places in a certified manner so that everybody would be able to add them up themselves. So we do think exit polls would be useful, uh, but there are also a variety of other observations and ways that the uh, count can get checked. Well, I appreciate that, and my time is about to expire. Uh, I would say that if there's anything that I personally am disappointed in uh, in my trips to Pakistan. It's that for the amount of aid, the amount of support that we give this president, and the fact that his election itself was clearly flawed at best, that we're not pushing for this check and balance of at least having a prime minister who uh, whose uh, election is considered to be at a higher standard would seem to be the minimum that we can ask for this president. His position is secure. His position uh, is, is in excess of what was originally intended in their own constitution because of the nature of how he came to power and now has become president again. Uh, so uh, at least I, for one, am disappointed that three days after the election we expect a team to leave, even if in they're there in the midst of uncovering huge amounts of discrepancies. Observation on election day, as you said, is not the only tool. But if you're forced, if your visas expire and you're forced to pack up and be gone three days after an election, it's very clear that you're not able to follow up in the aftermath of what is likely to be a less than full and fair election. Sir, I, I think you put it very well on the need for a strong player, a strong prime minister uh, who emerges from a credible election, that, that that has to be an important part of stability in Pakistan. We push very hard for that in a variety of ways, especially in trying to improve this process. Right now, uh, we've worked with IRI, we think, to um, solve the problems that they saw with their observation mission. The remaining issue, as far as we understand it, is only the question of security for their personnel. And uh, we're continuing to work with them and talk with them about that. Should they decide to go back, uh, then we'll work on keeping them there. Thank you, Mr. Isom. Mr. Lynch, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Ambassador, thanks for your good work and uh, your willingness to come before the committee to help us with ours. Um, in our last visit, uh, we went into some of the tribal areas and went into Peshawar and the indications from some of the parties was that uh, they would indeed be participating in these elections, but they felt confident, and this was this testimony was repeated uh, to the chairman and I and others in, in other meetings with some of the uh, candidates. They felt that it wasn't a question of whether there would be election rigging uh, by the administration, but how much election rigging would actually go on. And uh, so while there's participation there, there are some restrictions, as you've, you've uh, noted, regarding the media. One of the restrictions that we were told of, that uh, the candidates for, for, for the parliament were not allowed to criticize Musharraf for the administration. Uh, originally, he had control of all the media, all the major media outlets. Uh, there's also some charges that, uh, that uh, Musharraf's people had Begun, begun the uh, criminal reporting of, of certain opposition uh, party members, which put their eligibility to participate in the elective process, campaigning uh, in question, and also whether they would be allowed to actually vote. Uh, during our visit, uh, the DCM, uh, Peter Bodie, was nice enough to invite us back to participate as uh, election monitors, but I, I guess with all those factors in there, and some that you've addressed and I have not, uh, is it a worthwhile uh, exercise, as, as Mr. Isis says, uh, what's the effectiveness 
uh, what would be the effectiveness of, of us as members going back into Pakistan during the election? And uh, are we at that point where we need to use the only leverage we have, apparently, with, uh, with Musharraf, which is uh, economic aid by the United States to Pakistan? Um, I think you raise a number of very important questions, sir. Uh, first of all, I don't think I mean, we don't we don't necessarily accept a certain level of fraud. But if history is any guide and the current reports are any guide, um, we should expect some. And there's a uh, there's an interesting group called the Fair and Free Elections Network. I think it is F A F E N dot org. Uh, in Pakistan is the domestic uh, observer network and they have regular reports of what's going on in the provinces and districts and if you see their reports for example they they report interference by local government officials uh, in all kinds of places on behalf of all the different parties um, slightly somewhat higher uh, sort of about a one-third of the districts had reported some interference for most of the parties and something on half or two-thirds where the government party is in charge so it, it's an indication, perhaps, of what one might expect uh, throughout Pakistan, a certain level of interference. On the other hand, I think it's harder to get away with it now. Um, even on the restrictions on the press, uh, there's an enormous explosion of media in the last uh, eight years under President Musharraf, actually. Uh, they've gone from something like four TV stations to almost 50. Um, and even with the restrictions that exist, uh, which we think should be lifted, uh, there's going to be a lot of reporting. Uh, there's going to be an enormous number of observers around. Um, the political parties are well organized, and believe me, they'll cry, cry foul if there are any fouls that exist. Uh, at the same time, I don't think we should give up on this election. Um, I think uh, if everybody works to make it a good election, uh, we can have a credible election in Pakistan. If everybody, political parties, election commission, election observers, foreigners, domestic civil society people, Everybody has to work to make this a good election so that the new leaders who emerge for Pakistan have that endorsement, have that legitimacy of coming out of a legitimate election process. And the election observers are important not just uh, to point out problems where they exist or to find fraud where it happens. Uh, they're important, I think, to keep the process honest. Just the fact that election observers are there are moving around looking at polling places, I think, tends to put a damper on, on uh, the excesses that might otherwise occur. And I guess the, the last part of my question, again, was the only leverage we have is, is really the economic aid that we provide to Pakistan, a couple of problem areas, the elections upcoming, and also uh, the willingness of, of Musharraf to take decisive action in South Waziristan against uh, uh, Bayatullah Massoud and uh, and also, you know, the uh, just the, the whole federally administered tribal areas where Al Qaeda and uh, the Taliban are, are resurgent. Uh, are we are we delivering a clear message that that Congress is very reluctant to commit, you know, further resources unless we see a a demonstrative change in behavior rather than some of the the passive uh, it's almost complicity uh, that we've seen in the past. I think. Uh I think it's a question that's easier in theory than in practice. Um, I don't think it's worth our while to withdraw money from girls' education, uh, all the money we put into education and health in Pakistan. I don't think it's in our interest to withdraw money from the counterterrorism efforts in Pakistan. Um, I think uh, we are very careful about our assistance. We have taken steps recently to focus it much more. Uh, on helping the people of Pakistan and helping uh, the authorities go after the extremists. And there is a lot of fighting going on. And they've lost, um, they've lost 1,000 people to terrorism in the last year. They've lost 250 uh, members of the security forces since July. Um, so they are engaged in a fight. Um, and I think it behooves us to help them uh, pursue that as, 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 you know, with the best possible tools. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Chairman, I, I just want to say, uh, you know, just in response, what we're hearing from, from our and our committee is that many, much of the resources that we've given Pakistan in the past have not gone to education. And they, it's gone really towards the Pakistani profile vis-a-vis -vis India and, and the Kashmir and, and the military programs and not uh, 
not not for education. So I think uh, if you look at the numbers, you'll that. see it's somewhat of a different answer. Let me, it's it's yeah. a point well taken in, in both uh, response and, uh, and the question. We're going to get into that issue in hearings coming up in the not too distant future on that for, for two purposes. One, to find out exactly what has been going on and, and how effective that's been, but also as we look forward to some of the changes the administration has recommended and some that Congress uh, has put into law. If we're going to be delivering aid, we have to be concerned about how it uh, is made, whether we're accountable for the money where it goes, and whether or not it's going to be effective given the uh, security situation there now as well. Absolutely. So, uh, agree point well that, taken, sir. Mr. Lynch. Yeah. We appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador, th there seems to be a threshold question and a conflict. Uh, on the one hand, it's very clear that uh, stability in Pakistan is vital to American interest and to into the region. Uh, number two, uh, Ambassador Negroponte has said that uh, uh, Mr. Musharraf is indispensable. He's the indispensable man. Uh, and there's a view uh, widely shared uh, in the State Department and the Congress that free and fair elections are probably the most uh, effective way to assure stability in, in, uh, uh, in Pakistan. But President Musharraf, uh, by his actions, uh, suspending the Constitution press restrictions uh, in essentially firing the judiciary uh, has fundamentally compromised the integrity of any electoral process that uh, that follows. Uh, number one, uh, do you see Mr. Musharraf as the indispensable man, as uh, was indicated by Mr. Negroponte? I do, sir. Um, I think he's, he's led the nation uh, the way it's gone. But let's also remember now he's taking on a different role. He's taking on a role of president, which he's had before, but no longer as as, right, so as the guy in charge. So he, he's going to be one player, indispensable. A, a man along with a, a newly elected prime minister, and a well, let, number let of me, other government let institutions. Let me just follow up on this, I, and I can understand it. There's a real dilemma for policymakers in our yeah. position. I totally appreciate that, but you know, the the firing of the judiciary would more or less be the equivalent to the president of the United States in November of 2000, when the Bush v. Gore, Gore v. Bush case was before the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, getting an apprehension that it wasn't going to go the way the President wanted it in firing the Supreme Court. And the threshold question that American citizens would ask is whether that had any legitimacy and whether until the restoration of the uh, judicial branch could you have any integrity in future elections that would be subject to the supervision ultimately of that independent judiciary. Uh, the question I have is this. Uh, why is it not the position uh, of the United States government that as a condition for aid or for, as a, more importantly, as a condition of confidence that the electoral process in fact will be free and fair, we have to require or demand that President Musharraf restore the independent judiciary? I think, sir, um, first of all, I don't think the analogy stands up to expert scrutiny and people I've talked to about Pakistan who've studied this a lot more than I do um, have said it's not, you can't compare it to the United States. We have right. different don't, history, don't compare tradition. It to the U.S. Do you there has believe, been, no, let me just ask this. Yeah. We'll leave out the comparison. Do you believe that it was appropriate for President Musharraf to fire uh, the Supreme Court? No. And do you believe that it should be our policy in order to achieve the goal of free and fair elections that we demand that the President restore the Supreme Court justices to their positions? We believe that it's very important for Pakistan to have an independent and responsible judiciary. Uh, but that, that in itself is a very political issue in Pakistan. There's a lot of controversy about it. About it. Uh, we certainly no, I'm asking want them position. to deal with it. No, I, I'm asking the State Department position. Is it the State Department position that the judges who've been fired should be restored? Our, our view is that the issue of an independent judiciary in Pakistan can't be solved that simply. So that the President is allowed to fire uh, the independent judges on the Supreme Court? And our, our view is that it was not a good move, uh, but that to fix it, it needs to be done with the full political process with a newly elected prime minister and other leaders, and they have to try to get together and figure out how to have a good ind and independent judiciary in Pakistan. Well, is it, in my understanding is that if we have a new election, President Musharraf retains the power 
uh, to uh, dissolve the parliament. Is that right or wrong? Uh, that's been the case for a long time, yeah. All right, so then, in fact, if he can retain the power to dissolve the parliament, if the parliament takes an action to restore the judiciary, then President Musharraf has current power to dissolve the parliament and negate that action. Is that right? Um, in theory, yes. I mean, a as you all know, there's there's sort of constitutional law and there's politics. Well, um, see, here's the dilemma uh, from my from I think the American perspective, and I don't mean to be difficult on these because you're facing yeah. an extraordinarily difficult situation. You know, we're we're stuck with the with the devil we know, but there's an inherent conflict that I think we might want to directly acknowledge, and that's on the one hand. Uh, we believe in free and fair elections, but on the other hand, uh, the person who's, quote, going to implement this has already sabotaged any possibility that the people who are going to vote uh, can uh, be confident that it is a free and fair election, or if it is, he won't be able to overturn the action of their vote by dissolving the parliament they elected. That's, and you just acknowledge that can happen. And, and that may or may not happen. Well, but it may I or think may not happen, but what we have is a situation where the people in Pakistan who want to vote uh, are no dopes, and they understand that ultimately what they vote is totally uh, secondary to what President Musharraf decides. If you look at the history of Pakistan, you've had prime ministers kicked out by um, presidents and by the army. Um, some of that is in the Constitution, some of it's not. Um, the fact is, we're going to have a new political situation after the election. Uh, the parties are participating, uh, yeah. and we hope they can get a fair representation. Just one, one final question. Do you think there might be some benefit to how the people of Pakistan perceive the United States' commitment to their right to free and fair elections if we stated explicitly and directly to President Musharraf that we believe in order to achieve those free and fair elections, he should restore the judiciary to its independent status. I think some would think that was great and some would not. <laughs> okay. Um, the fact is it's a very political environment in Pakistan. The judiciary has been a matter of, judi of political controversy. They need to deal with it. They need to have an independent judiciary, but I can't see them doing it until after the election with all the players, including the new players. And if there's a good election, the new players will be credibly elected and have a lot of say in the matter. Thank you, Mr. Welch. I, I hope you're right. Just make the note that I, I'm stunned when you keep saying that there are good elections. You know, if the judicial situ judiciary situation isn't going to be resolved, then there aren't going to be good elections in the sense. There are going to be tainted elections and the question is the degree of taint on that. But all the testimony that we've had in this committee from all of the people who are experts in the area that have been over there that assess the election process all remind us of the important role the judiciary plays in the election. Uh, the Election Commission, which is not still not a, a full complement of people on that commission, 1,300 complaints uh, continue to be unresolved to the Election Commission even before they have the balloting. So uh, I'm, I'm just surprised always to hear the election about good elections. I think uh, it's a term that we, we might not want to get caught up on. There won't be good elections. There will be uh, elections, and the question will be how much taint is going to be involved in those elections. Uh, on, a, on a scale from terrible to great, uh, it will be somewhere in the middle. Exactly. Mr. Yamath, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Up, it, up is on, down is off. It's, oh, yeah, now it's on. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador, welcome. And I want to continue this discussion because it's a line of uh, discussion that we pursued with Senator <coughs> Daniel and Mr. Garrett and uh, Mr. Schneider. December. And the question is, we all talked about the confidence that the, pa the Pakistani uh, people have in the results of the election. We all understand that um, there are two elements, elements to that, the procedural aspects, which uh, may or may not be the most important aspects, and then the overall question of whether you can have a legitimate election in the environment that exists there. And that was prior to the assassination. Um, one of the things that I asked of them, of the gentlemen who were here before, was what measures are going to be used to determine, in your estimation, uh, as to whether the, the election is legitimate or not, procedural ones being one aspect of it, as I said. And the, the issue being, if we are in a situation in which the only measure of or whether there is a legitimate election is whether Musharraf is rejected 
overwhelmingly, then are we not in the position, a, a very difficult position, of having been uh, perceived as lending our imprimatur to a election that is flawed and what the ramifications are for our ongoing efforts in Pakistan and that part of the world? I don't think the, the standard for judging the election can be who wins and who loses. Um, there are going to be a lot of voices commenting on the election, describing what they saw. We're going to have embassy observers, European observers, we hope American observers, uh, this huge domestic network that's going to be there. We'll listen to the observers. We'll listen to the media. And what do they report? What do they say? We'll listen to the political parties. I mean, frankly, the political parties have decided that, you know, whatever the distortions, whatever the possibilities of fraud, whatever the faults and flaws of the election commission, uh, that they're going to participate and they're going to go for it. Um, we're trying to continue to work right up to the last moment and even afterwards uh, to try to give them every opportunity to get a fair result, a result that truly reflects what the people wanted. And I think by listening to all these voices from people on the ground in Pakistan, on the ground, uh, we will know, we will all know, um, how good an election it was and how distorted it was. And, and, and obviously we have to make judgments at that point. We've made very, very clear uh, to everyone in Pakistan that we think having a good election is essential to moving forward with Pakistan. It's an essential part of our relationship. Um, and it's, it's not in any way contradictory with our overall goals of a stable society fighting terrorism. It's part and parcel of that. I agree with that, but the, uh, like I said, when we had our hearing back in December, and I raised this question, I think there was general agreement that, that it was possible that that could be the perceptual problem uh, following the election, that the only way it will be perceived, not because of procedural matters, the only way it will be perceived as legitimate is if Musharraf is rejected. And therefore, if that becomes the measure, what can we do, or have you thought about what we can do, to tr essentially refute the idea that we were complicit in basically a flawed election process? I, I guess um, you know some circles will base their view of the process on the outcome. You know, did we or did we not get what we deserve? And people always have a higher expectation of what they deserve than what they end up with, but. I think generally, you know, people have a sense from polling going back uh, over the last year and the changes in attitudes. Um, people have a sense of where it might end up, but I think it's more the reports from the people on the ground on the contact of the elections, on um, how uh, how open the environment was in the end, how much exposure they were able to get through television or through rallies. Uh, it's important to listen to the details and not just look at the totals. Um, and, yeah, some people will complain, and, and some will complain more loudly than others. But, you know, one of the key questions will be to the, to the political parties accept the outcome to the point where they think it's a, it's a basis to form a government and to move forward. I, I, I come from a media background, though. I, I would ask you, do, are you confident that the media is sufficiently uh, free to provide the type of open discussion of the election as it's as it's being conducted, there so is still confident, there is confidence on the voter that they're getting an accurate yeah. report. There are still some restrictions on the media which we think should should be lifted and can be lifted uh, between now and the election. Uh, but I have to say, there's an awful lot of discussion out there, and there's an awful lot of reporting out there. So uh, there'll be a lot there, but not as much as perhaps there should be. Thank you, uh, right. Mr. Yarmuth. Mr. Platt, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure. Just okay. I'm not sure. It's up, but I'm not sure if it's up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate your testimony and, and the importance of this topic. I do want to focus a little bit, not just specific on the election, but on the, uh, the militants in Pakistan and our efforts to both help the Pakistan government in, in, in going after their uh, militants who are um, trying to derail de democratic efforts in Pakistan and then also how that impacts us in Afghanistan significantly. Um, 
it, it was reported in the New York Times uh, on Sunday about uh, DNI McConnell and, and CIA Director uh, Hayden's um, reported recent visit regarding us having a greater latitude with their CIA operatives in the uh, um, tribal areas, and that supposedly uh, President Musharraf's response was a rejection of this idea, and that they will continue on their own to combat this uh, this um, challenge. Um, one is this seen by the department and by the administration as a significant change in President Musharraf's efforts in working with us uh, in this regard, and if so, what is going to be our, our efforts or our response to that, ch that change in position? Um, Congressman, there's a, uh, a limit to how much we can discuss these issues in this session and a limit to how much I can discuss the business of other departments and agencies. Um, I think there's only really one point that I can make, and that is Pakistan has been and continues to be a partner in the war on terrorism. Uh, many of their soldiers and uh, officials have lost their lives uh, in the fight against Taliban and al-Qaeda. Uh, they have been able to capture uh, hundreds of uh, very dangerous people, and they've been a, a partner with us. They've worked on it. We've worked with them. Uh, it's a sovereign country. We work with them within, the, within their own country uh, as they wish and as they decide. And so uh, we have, I think, a, a positive relationship. Uh, we're always, we're all looking for how we can advance this relationship and advance the, the cause that we believe in, that we both believe in, and that is the fight against terrorism. Mr. Platt, if I might just to see, we're going to allow you to have extra time. I don't want to take it out of your time, but there's a, you weren't here at the beginning to note that uh, Ambassador Bauscher is going to be testifying at 1 o'clock in front of the Intelligence Committee to cover those areas that can't be covered here including some questions about uh, a different view of what the ambassador says in terms of some of the Pakistani troops laying down their arms and yep. being taken to, uh, in, uh, to, to uh, imprisoned or otherwise set aside on that. But to the extent that the ambassador can't get into that detail here, it will be uh, covered in the other hearing, and I think you will have access to okay. the, to the uh, minutes. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, and I do respect uh, the, the sensitivity and what you can say in this open setting, uh, but clearly what goes on with the CIA, with the DNI, um, impacts your department's ability to then work on these issues of our relations with uh, Pakistan and, and specifically the election. Um, maybe, and, and I don't want to diminish Pakistan's efforts in partnering with us. I was in Pakistan in September, uh, in fact, on the anniversary of September 11th, and uh, appreciate the sacrifices that their troops and personnel have made in trying to assist us and combat uh, these uh, radical militants. Um, but in the, the Fada region, the northwest province um, um, area, my understanding is administrations talked about additional, additional hundreds of millions of dollars of <coughs> aid for those specific regions. And, and I guess maybe from, from the Department of State's perspective, how do we, to our taxpayers, say we're going to commit these uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to an area that we don't have confidence or under any reasonable control by the Pakistan government, yet we're going to put more of our money in, into that region? It's, it's a difficult area to work in, um, not only because of the insecurity, but because of these unusual governing arrangements that go back to colonial times. Um, the plan for sustainable development in the tribal areas was developed very closely uh, by the Pakistanis with us. And it is a, a solid program, we think. And one strong element of that program is in the early stages now is to start building the administrative apparatus to uh, reach out to the people, to conduct projects, to build bridges and schools, and uh, conduct health programs uh, in a verifiable and auditable way so that they have a set of institutions that can carry out projects in this area and, and get things done. We do have some experience up there. Our narcotics affairs section is building, building, building roads, doing training up there for a number of years. Uh, the Agency for International Development has built, uh, I think, about half of the 65 schools that they have planned to build in those areas. Uh, we have child and maternal health programs in the tribal areas already. So we have some experience working with NGOs, working with contractors, 
uh, working with people who can get things done in those areas. Now, obviously, it's easier to do things where the situation is calmer. So at any given moment, we may be working here and not there. And that'll probably continue. But yes, we do have plans. Um, we're going to put about $750 million into this area over five years. And the essential goal is to give these people a chance at uh, economic opportunity, a chance at jobs, uh, and a chance to be part of the national economy. And we'll be coming to Congress also with legislation on uh, reconstruction opportunity zones to open up opportunities there as well. It, Mr. Chair, if I can just a quick follow-up. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, in, in my numerous visits to Afghanistan, where we've had some important successes in um, aid investment and development, whether it be roads, schools, hospitals, a key in, in, in being out with PRTs and Jalalabad being it was kind of a role model uh, when I was there uh, a few years back for how to do this. A very important uh, part of this effort was partnering our military with our USAID uh, officials in, in the civilian military partnership that provided the security along with the investment of the development effort. How are we going to ensure that same ability in this area where Musharraf is very publicly resisting us having a greater presence? The, um, the basic development plan is a Pakistani development plan. They're putting, it's about a $2 billion plan. We're putting in $750 million <coughs> over five years. There'll be about $100 million a year for a slightly longer period. We're also working with their military to two things. One is to transform the Frontier Corps, the local security mm -hmm. forces, into a more capable force, and second of all, to help with some of their units um, who need to do the job right now of fighting the militancy and working with them in these parallel tracks and talking to them, working with them about how they can make these two tracks work in tandem, uh, both of fighting the militants but also offering opportunity to the people who live there. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Ms. McCollum, you're recognized in five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when elections take place on a weak foundation, they can actually create divisions that a democracy is supposed to be able to heal. I had the opportunity, uh, thanks to Mr. Tierney, to be in Pakistan and met with many of the, the people, uh, NGO groups, and that working on the election issue. I was pleased to hear in your uh, testimony that they have now published um, when we had the lunch and uh, spoke with people at length, the media hadn't been brought, brought into how they were going about uh, setting up the roles uh, for the elections. There was, no, uh, there was no transparency, there was no public look in to see as to how these elections were being prepared, which was a huge mistake. Uh, in my opinion, and I think we, we all share that and express that, so uh, it was nice to hear that there has been a little bit of action taken. But I'm still very concerned about the upcoming elections in, in Pakistan, uh, the potential for violence and instability. I mean, we saw that recently with the, the assassination in Pakistan. We're witnessing now with what is taking place in Kenya. A month since the Kenya elections, and I don't think anybody in their wildest expectations thought what's taking place in Kenya uh, would. The riots, the killing, the mass, mass killings. And in fact, uh, the Nairobi, uh, in the city of Nairobi, a moderate opposition leader was, was gunned down, assassinated. The New York Times has said, quote, Kenyans are literally ripping their country apart, uprooting miles of railroad tracks, chopping down telephone poles, burning government office, and looting schools. The potential for a flawed election to destabilize Pakistan is a real one. And considering uh, last year's uh, challenges back and forth with what was, who was even going to be allowed to stand for election, the, the, the assassination, which I've mentioned already, I'm very concerned about a breakdown and the effect it would have on regional stability. So my question is, what steps should the U.S. and the international community be taking to prepare in case widespread violence and destabilization would follow an election in Pakistan? What steps have been taken? What discussions are taking place? Because the potential of the spilling over into affecting NATO forces into Afghanistan is real. And as uh, we have respected, and I believe we should respect, the sovereignty of Pakistan and what operations are conducted within its borders. Um, if, this, if this comes apart, 
what happens next? Is there a plan B and are we working with the international community so it's well understood what the international community's reaction would be? Um, Ma'am, I, I appreciate the question. I think I have to say honestly our first plan is plan A is to try to make this uh, process as good as possible. We, we do know the history of elections in Pakistan and where there's been uh, fraudulent elections, uh, widespread abuses, uh, there's been violence afterwards. And that's one more reason why it's important to have as good an election as possible and everybody should work on that and that's what we're doing and trying to get others to do. Uh, the Army is going to deploy to try to provide security at pol polling places uh, and keep down uh, what you might call the uh, well, to the level of violence. The fact that the elections themselves are targeted by the violent extremists, just as Benazir Bhutto was. Um, other political leaders, government officials in Pakistan are still being targeted. Uh, the militants are anti-election um, as well as anti-establishment and anti-politics and against the political leaders. So there's a, there's a heavy threat that, that comes from that, uh, from that side of Pakistan, from the, from the militancy and the violent militancy that comes out of the tribal areas. Um, exactly what we would do in the case of widespread violence after the election would really depend on what it was and where it came from. Uh, if it were ignited by the militants, um, there's a chance that we could work and see the society band together. Um, but uh, if it were, were the result of electoral fraud, that obviously creates a much more complicated situation. So um, I don't think I'm really able to give you a clear answer right now is exactly what we would do. But I think it's uh, what you point out is a very real possibility, and we all need to uh, push very hard to try to avoid coming to that point. Mr. Chair, I have just a, a second left. Uh, on an earlier question, you were asked about the, the Scotland Yard investigations. Mr. Tierney asked, uh, asked you about that. And you, uh, if I heard you correctly, and so I, I want to give you an opportunity to, 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 to make, sh make sure I understood what you said correctly. If I heard you correctly, you said that there was no need for the United Nations or any or any other such uh, organization to be involved in that. You thought that the Pakistanis and the, the, this very limited Scotland Yard here would ha hold it. That wasn't the U.S.'s position with the assassination in Lebanon. How is this so radically different that we would have uh, such a silent voice on having a robust investigation? I think we've been very clear on the need for a robust and thorough investigation. The question is who should conduct it. Um, I don't think the conditions uh, that led us to conclude that there was an absolute necessity of an UN investigation in the Lebanon case uh, necessarily apply in Pakistan. Um, we will certainly be watching this investigation very, very closely. We think the addition of Scotland Yard, uh, whatever their mandate, uh, does help uh, provide uh, more uh, insight and credibility into the conduct of the investigation. Uh, and we'll all be watching very carefully to see how thoroughly it's done and, and what the results are. <coughs> thank you, Ms. McCollum. Uh, Mr. Shays, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Again, uh, Ambassador, thank you for being here. I, um, I wrestle with this, and I realize there are limits to what you can say publicly, but what I wrestle with is that Musharraf, however well intended, overthrew a duly elected government that was sec uh, secular, not sectarian. And that in order to retain power, my read is that he has had to play over the past few years uh, to the sectarian interests. And that that now has put him in the mess that he's in. I can't get beyond the fact that he basically dissolved the judiciary and put them aside. And it seems that almost everything that follows from that point becomes a farce. Uh, and I wrestle with the fact that we have elections, uh, and I say, well, you have a democratic elections, but you have a government that overthrew a branch that's supposed to guarantee that the Constitution is followed in a democratic way. Walk me through what I have just described and tell me where my fears are misplaced. I think your fears are correct, but we won't know until the process unfolds whether they actually come to pass. Um, 
Uh, whatever comes. First of all, I think you have to look back at the history of Pakistan and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm not the world's expert on this, but in, in my brief readings, I think just about every leader has had a, a confrontation and sometimes a very difficult one uh, with the judiciary. Uh, you referred to Nawaz Sharif and, and uh, the man that was uh, overthrown by Musharraf. At one point, his party people went and ran the Supreme Court out of town, or at least out of their building. Uh, so it's the, the, the confrontation between the executive and judiciary in Pakistan uh, goes back a long way. Has been a, it's been a very political issue throughout the history. That doesn't deny the fact that there absolutely needs to be an independent judiciary in Pakistan. The question is, how do you get one? And uh, at this point, um, having a, a, a legitimately elected prime minister and political leaders uh, who can come out of this election and uh, be part of that process of deciding how to restructure and, and the judiciary is, is very important. And that's where, uh, yes, the process is distorted by all sorts of things. Uh, let, by let the let restrictions on the question. media, the lack of independent judiciary, all that stuff. In our judgment, our government's judgment, did the judiciary overstep its, its bounds? Did it do something that was contrary to their powers? I don't, I don't think that's a judgment for us to make, but no, we thought that kicking out the judiciary was a bad move, was a real mistake. Well, I'll just uh, conclude by saying that my questions were also going to focus on the violence that is to come. Um, and what happened in Kenya is, it strikes me, very likely to happen uh, in Pakistan, and I don't know how we respond to it, but I think it's going to be very likely to, f to happen. Well, we'll know in a few weeks whether we have violence, whether we have how right. good an election we have. And that's true. And uh, uh, do we have a contingency plan to respond to violence if it takes place? I said we I don't need to deal to with how it, it is. comes from. I don't need to know what it is, but do we have plans if that happens? We've looked at various scenarios, but until you find, you know, until you see the actual situation, it's very hard to decide precisely how to deal with it. Well, thank you again for being here. And, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding these hearings in such a timely way. Thank you, Mr. Shays. Mr. Bauscher, I just want to follow up on that particular thing because we've made that an emphasis of the hearing on this. Um, Mark Schneider, who was the, here on behalf of the International Crisis Group, spends a lot of time over there. His testimony was this. Musharraf, by permanently barring the previous Supreme Court and the provincial high court judges who refused to bow to his edict, has assured that the commission will be compromised of his hand, uh, comprised of his handpicked choices. District returning officers, returning officers, and assistant returning officers who supervise the actual polling process in each province are either district court judges themselves or are appointed by district court judges, all under the guidance of the provincial high courts whose new members are suspect. Remember that Musharraf has sacked 13 of the 17 Supreme Court judges and more than 40 high court judges, and any electoral complaint of fraud, rigging, or electoral violation ultimately will be heard on appeal to those courts. Stacking the full range of high courts nationally and provincially, including naming a totally new high court in Islamabad, amounts to hijacking the electoral process itself. That's our concern, I think, in a nutshell, that the, the very people that are supposed to set up the process before balloting assure that the voting polls are there, assure that the balloting process is legitimate, assure that complaints about that are determined in a fair way, are people that have been put in place by, Mr. by President Musharraf, whose own election is suspect, whose dismissal of the original court was suspect, and now whose appointees are suspect. So that, you know, in terms of the people that we've heard from and all the parties, they may be participating in this election, but all of them feel strongly that that's the crux of the matter, and that in essence, Again, they can't get a fair election. They can just get the best that they can get. Uh, and the question is, how tainted is it going to be? And if it's too tainted, all hell is going to break loose. So I just leave that to say you the, the groundwork of some of the testimony that raises that question and why we think can it's I, Can I make one Certainly. quick comment on Certainly. that? I don't, I don't disagree that that's a, a serious concern. Um, but I do think that there are a number of ways to deal with it, no matter how beholden or dishonest any individual returning officer is along the chain. If he has to do his counting and his business in, in full transparency with the media watching and the parties watching and the observers watching, it's a lot harder for him to add in a few thousand votes here and a few thousand votes there. We have pushed very, very hard on the transparency issue for that Except, reason. Except, Ambassador, there are 64,000 polling places. There will not be observers at every one. There will not be media at every there'll one. Be, and there will be plenty of opportunity, as historically has happened in the past, 
for mischief to occur, and, that, and that's the problem. It is such a vast area. Now, we would like that to be cleared up before the election. We would like the media code of conduct to be uh, changed before the uh, election. We would like the people that are in prison to be out before the election changes. But when we have Mr. Negroponte, Ambassador Negroponte, making statements that President Musharraf is indispensable to the United States, what leverage do we have? I think what makes what motivates him to change his conduct? You already told him you're indispensable. We put all our chips with you. We don't care how the election comes out. Uh, you're going to be there. We're going to deal with you. Uh, what leverage do we have with him to change any of these things? He, he has put himself in a new position, and we're going to have to deal with him in that new position. Um, he has committed himself to a democratic transition, to a transparent election, and I think the leverage is his own commitments. Uh, the leverage is that he has made those statements. He has made them in public repeatedly uh, to us and to others, and we expect him to live up to those commitments. Well, according to the, uh, the latest poll over there, a really comprehensive public poll, 67 percent of Pakistanis want him to resign immediately, and 70 percent say his government doesn't deserve re-election. So, you know, he's treading on some incredibly thing, and I just hope that we concentrate on, you know, not necessarily bucking up Mr. Musharraf, but bucking up the people's choice over there and, and working with them on that and somehow find leverage despite the fact that the administration has turned them indispensable, find some leverage, uh, maybe in view of the fact that General Kayani has, has set some distance to him now saying that the Army will stay out of the elections, maybe since the retired Army officers have made a statement against uh, Musharraf or whatever, maybe we can capitalize on that for some leverage to get him to do what we think needs to be done before the elections. We'll work with all the institutions in Pakistan, civil society, the presidency, the Army, uh, the politicians, the elected prime minister. Um, it's very important for us that there be a balanced and stable leadership and, and group in Pakistan. But I think fundamentally our view is let the people vote and let the votes be counted fairly. Oh, I don't want to go around in a circle on that, but yeah. what are we doing? What is the United States doing to press for the release, uh, the immediate release of those that are uh, the political opposition leaders, the judges, and the Bar Association members who are in prison, Aitis Hassan, the president of, Supreme, uh, of the Supreme Court Bar amongst them, uh, are we just passively asking nicely and, and then letting whatever the answer is go? Or are we aggressively no, we've, insisting that these people ought to be we've, released? We've pursued this at all levels. Uh, we've raised it repeatedly. We've made public statements like my statements today that these people should be released from detention. It was reported that uh, the government of Pakistan expelled an American journalist, uh, Nick Schmeidel, uh, because of an article that he wrote in the uh, New York Times magazine about the next generation of uh, Taliban, local Taliban in Pakistan. Uh, and the electoral prospects for the religious political parties. Uh, are we doing anything with regard to that expulsion? Have we taken a position? Or we've, we've raised it with the Pakistani government. Don't think it was justified. Does any other, Mr. Welsh, do you have any further questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. Mr. Platts, do you have any other questions? Okay. Just, just an observation. Uh, we, we, we seem really to have a, have a dilemma. I mean, and it is, that we need Musharraf more than he needs us, and we're willing to and want to hope that he supports free and fair elections, but we'll continue to support him if he doesn't. And it seems to boil down to that. And in the world of uh, uh, terrorist threat, uh, maybe that's the decision that uh, the United States government has to make. Uh, but I wonder whether uh, we should be more explicit about what the real uh, balance of, of interest is here uh, so that there's not a cynical a reaction on the part of Pakistanis. I have to say, I think you know we have fundamental interest in Pakistani sure. people and their success. We have a strong interest in fighting terrorism, but we also see a successful transition to democracy as part of that process, as part of the stability and the platform, if you wish, to fight terrorism. And uh, we, we're not; our interests are not dominated by any one segment of society or any one leader. Uh, the, uh, we look forward to working with all segments of society and all the leaders that emerge, particularly those who emerge from the election. Ambassador, yeah. I can't leave without asking you one question. I don't mean to be a wise guy on this, but I, I'm trying to assess our, our degree of um, importance that we put on this issue. I think it's, it's high. I think your earlier statement of this, uh, of General Musharraf's actions in dismissing the court and uh, declaring emergency and changing the Constitution where you got it at one time as a bump in the road. Is it fair to say that that was an unfortunate expression and that we put a much higher degree of... I, I said a lot of things that day. Uh, that was unfortunately one phrase that I used and I uh, immediately regretted it and uh, it was a very serious problem and, and we're that's, trying our best to overcome it. terrific to hear and I'm things. glad you say that. Yes, sir. We have, which, have, which is why I want to give the Ambassador a chance to uh, 
do a do-over, as they say, on the playground on that. <laughs> Ambassador, uh, the last question I have is on December 21st, I sent a letter to the President uh, outlining a number of issues and concerns that have been raised here today. Do you have any uh, understanding of where that letter response is in process and when we might expect a reply? Uh, I'm sure there's people working on it right now and you'll get your reply people, as soon as I can find out who they are and uh, what they've done with it. I'll, I'll, we'll get it to you quickly, sir. Uh, Ambassador, let me close just by thanking you for uh, making yourself available today. Uh, we give you a little bit of time to maybe take a breath before you go before the Intelligence Committee where I'll see you. And Mr. Eicher, I believe, will also be there. And, and again, Appreciate thank it. you. Thank you, sir. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>here on C-SPAN 3 in about 35 minutes at 1 p.m. Eastern time. A news conference from former Senator John Edwards from New Orleans. He is expected to announce he is leaving.